the season is over for the Boston Red Sox. In a game in which they could have tried to salvage any playoff hopes that they had, the Red Sox came in and let the Astros absolutely mow them over at home to solidify the Red Sox chances of really not making the playoffs. You are locked on Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Red Sox, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Gabby Hurlba, former ESPN social media associate and current host of the Boston Balling Podcast. Here to bring you the latest in all things Boston Red Sox Monday through Friday straight to your favorite podcast feed as hard as that may be for you to tune in every day you still absolutely very much should Sirius XM also has you covered for the home broadcast of every Red Sox game don't miss a single pitch when you download the app and search Red Sox and the Red Sox home broadcast has you covered today's episode is brought to you by Bunches. Download the Bunches app today, and when you do, our friends at Bunches have featured the Locked On MLB Bunch in the Discover tab. You can also click the link in the description slash show notes to join the Locked On MLB Bunch community today. The Red Sox season is over. I mean, there's really nothing else to say at this point. The Red Sox went into this series after having lost a series against the Dodgers and they were four and a half games out of a wild card spot, which still gave them a good chance to win some games and get themselves back into a wild card spot. And instead of taking advantage of that, the Red Sox did the exact opposite and just did not play good baseball at all in this series. It started with the starting pitching and the fact that the Red Sox just have been unable to get their starters through five innings as of late. It really stems from that. And I knew going into this season that the starting pitching for the Red Sox was going to be questionable. I hoped that it would be better than I thought, but with the number of starters that they had that were either injured to start the season or are injury prone because no offense, they do have a few starters in that rotation right now that you can't trust to be healthy longer than a a short period of time. Chris Sale falls into that category. I'd argue that James Paxton falls into that category and even Garrett Whitlock to an extent who's been platooning as a starter and a reliever in his time with Boston so far. So when you go into the season with a rotation where you're relying on guys who really haven't proven as of late that they can consistently stay healthy, that is asking for trouble with the pitching staff. And that's exactly what happened with the Red Sox this season. For the most part, the pitching was not an absolute dumpster fire this year and the bullpen was a big part of that because the bullpen overall especially in the first half of the season was very solid and the starting pitching was managing to get the outs make plays keep the score relatively low but when you look at the Red Sox starting pitching to other rotations in the league and compare them it, the Red Sox starting rotation is just really not great and not stable and could fall apart at any time as of now. So it starts with the starting pitching because of the fact that there are a lot of starters in this rotation right now who are very shaky and that absolutely needs to change this offseason. It has to be the first Thing that the Red Sox address heading into 2024. And I have to sit here and say now, trust me, I am one of the most positive fans that you'll ever meet. I try my best to not close the door until I absolutely have to. But getting swept by Houston at home, which, by the way, is the first time that the Astros have ever swept the Red Sox at Fenway Park, That just truly feels like a big dagger in the chest to what was already a very up and down season for Boston. They could never quite 
make it there. They were on the brink a lot and could never get to the point where they could make that big push to be good enough. Every time they figured out one piece of the puzzle, something else would go wrong. So it starts with the starting pitching. I look at this series and resort to the pitching um, and the starters not being able to get their job done as a big issue in this series. I look at the defense as a big issue in the series. They did not make smart baseball plays in this series. And I thought overall the defense was better in this series than it was in the Dodgers series. But there were still some miscues and misfires from the Red Sox defense. And I mentioned him the other day on the show, but having Trevor Story back, yes, his bat has been very weak since coming back from injury, but he can play defense. And when you really see him turn beautifully executed double plays at shortstop or he's sitting there fielding the ball well, throwing it well, not overthrowing the first baseman and knowing when to make a play at home or when to play, make a play at second base or first. That's what you realize the Red Sox were missing defensively for a lot of the season in that middle infield. So I'm grateful to have his defense back, but Devers has had some blunders at third base. Connor Wong has had some blunders defensively at catcher. Obviously Kike and Arroyo when they started in the middle infield had some blunders. Urias has also had some blunders when he's played second base and shortstop. They need to lock down the defense. And that needs to be truly figuring out who on this current roster right now has good enough defense to be able to be on this team next year and cut it because the defense was a huge difference maker for a lot of the season. So I'm pointing to that as another issue in this series. And also, the Red Sox just overall were not able to produce offensively. They were stringing together some runs on some weak hits in Wednesday's game. Um, Devers with an RBI ground out. I mean, I give Duvall a ton of credit because he's really been hitting consistently for this Red Sox team. And they were stringing together some hits and some runs. But I feel like this was an aftermath of their series against the Dodgers where they relied very heavily on the home run ball. And in this series against the Astros, they could not get those big hits. They'd have some base runners. They'd um, walk away from opportunities and not be able to capitalize on opportunities that they did have. Um, Even on Wednesday's game, they were down 7 to nothing strung together a few runs to come back and pull within three runs being down seven to four and then had some base runners after that and couldn't get that big hit to help turn the game around. So it was such a disappointing way for the Red Sox to go down. And finally, um, you know, there were some bullpen meltdowns in the series and that was to be expected as I've explained so many times on the show. So if you look at, All of those issues combined, it goes back to all the issues the Red Sox have had all season long with not being able to capitalize on opportunities, not having somebody to get that big hit for them, making defensive miscues. It's the misfires with the throws that are way off leading to more base runners, um, not making the smartest play on defense, um, not being able to turn two because the throw to first base is bad, or Devers bobbling a ball that seems like an easier play to make at third base, but then being able to nail the more challenging plays. Um, All of that combined on top of the fact that the pitching is so shaky, that ultimately is what went wrong for the Red Sox in this series, and it goes to show that the Astros are simply just a better team than Boston right now, and I hate to say it, but they are above where the Red Sox are at. Their lineup is scary, and they can hit, and if the Red Sox are going to make awful fielding mistakes, the Astros will capitalize on that, and I'm, and it's not like Houston showed off really 
a defensive masterclass in the series. They had their blunders too, but for the Red Sox, it was just really capitalizing on the defensive issues they've had all season long. So very frustrating series. And ultimately the season is over. That's all I can really say. No coming back from that. Coming up, I'm going to be talking about the man who took the mound on Wednesday in the game in a, in a contest that the Red Sox absolutely had to win to salvage any playoff hopes going over that next. If you like Twitter and you like chatting with other sports fans, then Bunches is the way to go for you. Bunches basically is an app that you can download on the app store and it's free and it's basically a social community where you talk about sports with other fans in real time. So it's basically just a giant group chat for sports fans. So if you think about the group chats you have on Twitter, where you're maybe talking Red Sox with other fans or Patriots or whatever the team may be, um, Bunches is an easier way to do that. Bunches has basically partnered with Locked On MLB to create a community. So you can download the Bunches app and join the Locked On MLB chat. And you can interact with other people who are fans of all baseball teams, not just the Red Sox. Um, it's really cool. Just click the link in the show notes slash description to join the app or go to the Apple store and download Bunches now. I'm telling you, you're going to love the conversations with other Locked On sports fans. Download the Bunches app today, and when you do, our friends at Bunches have featured the Locked On MLB in the Discover tab. You can also click the link in the description slash show notes to join the Locked On MLB Bunch community today. It is a lot of fun. I've been on it. People send really funny gifts in there, and it's basically just a big vent session if your team is not playing well or a celebration with other people in your fan base if your team is doing well. A great way to meet people if you've been looking to connect with other baseball fans. So I highly recommend checking it out. Cutter Crawford, what's an absolute disappointment on Wednesday? I mean, what the heck? Only went 2.2 innings, gave up seven hits and six earned runs, recorded one walk and one strikeout. I mean, what are we doing here? He got absolutely mashed on Wednesday. The Astros have a tough lineup, especially that one through four in their order. And if you are not throwing your best pitches, they will take advantage of that. And as a result, the Astros just kept stringing together hits. They got to him early on in the game, and it just did not stop. Once that second inning hit, they just kept stringing together those hits, scoring more runs, and it was clear that Crawford just could not figure it out. I've said over and over again, he has his moments, but he still has a lot he has to figure out. And his numbers on the road versus at Fenway are significantly different. At home, he has a 568 earned run average, and on the road, he has a 206 average. He's recorded 42 strikeouts at Fenway and 59 on the road, um, and he's given up 14 doubles at home and 15 on the road, 26 RBIs at home and 13 RBIs on the road. It's a significant difference, and that's a problem. You, if you can't figure out how to pitch at Fenway Park, you're not going to be able to be successful on this baseball team. And he's always looked more confident on the road. It just is what it is. He gets to Fenway Park, and it's almost like he gets swallowed up in the pressure of pitching in Boston. And it makes you wonder, is he a long-term solution for this rotation? Because you want guys in the rotation who have proven that they can handle the pressure that comes with playing here because Boston is a tough place to play, like I've said before. And it's just a really hard environment for players sometimes. And the fans are super passionate, which is fantastic. But not every player can handle that type of pressure. So the Red Sox need to look within themselves and say, Cutter has produced a lot 
of innings for us this season and has shown some improvement, but those home stats are concerning to me. You can't possibly look at that and say he'll figure it out because he's had all season to figure it out. It's a significant difference between pitching at home and pitching on the road. And yes, I understand that the Astros have as good of a lineup as they do, but that doesn't seem to matter to me in this situation because he's been getting rocked at home all season long, no matter what offense he's pitching against. Um, It just feels like his confidence level is a lot different at Fenway Park. And this once again goes along with the lack of Red Sox starters abilities to go deep into games. Um, as a result of his rough start, Cora had to use a large number of pitchers in this game. Seven total pitchers pitched on Wednesday. After Crawford, Joe Jakes came in, struck out the last batter of the inning, no problem. And then Whitlock picked, pitched two innings and gave up one run, but overall he was fine. And then Schreiber, Martin, Jansen, and Joe Vera. I'll shut it down after that because those are your go-to guys in the bullpen right now. Those are the guys that Cora has um, used in high leverage situations primarily. But of course, now the Red Sox were losing and what other choice did he really have? Because those guys are all available now. Because again, going with Barraclough in game one, you're seeing the results of all that now. um, And being able to give the other guys more time off in between outings. Um, So those are the high leverage bullpen guys that you can rely on. They all shut it down and did not give up any runs, really. I mean, the Astros were really quiet after they scored those six runs against Cutter Crawford. They only scored one run after that, and it was against Garrett Whitlock earlier on in the game, but then nothing across the board after that. So Bloom has done a good job of really building up that back end of the bullpen with Schreiber, Winkowski, who overall has been good, especially when he has traffic on the bases. I just think he's been overused once again, like everybody else in this bullpen. Brennan Bernardino, um, Chris Martin, Kenley Jansen. Those are your high leverage guys in the pen. Now you need to go through and address the middle of the bullpen guys. What is Whitlock's spot on this team? Is he a reliever or is he a starter? Nick Pavetta, what happens with him? Do you use him as a starter or as a longer term reliever? Lots to figure out here with the Red Sox bullpen. um, But that's another area that they could use some address, address, addressing of, I should say. Um, But Cutter Crawford start, extremely disappointing, lots of pressure on him heading into Wednesday. He had the chance to go in there and do what he could to try to salvage some ounce of the Red Sox season, and he couldn't get the job done. And like I said, when I say just this dagger to the heart on the season, it really is true. Every issue the Red Sox have had all season long absolutely nipped them in the butt in this series Nothing went right for Boston, and it just showed how many holes they actually have. I think the fact that they were playing well and offensively they've been producing this year, a lot of the holes weren't really coming through as much. But now that we've seen the majority of the season be played out and guys have been injured and then come back and people filling in in random spots, we're now seeing – the holes of what the Red Sox really need to address. And when you play a team like the Astros, who are a very strong team, and by the way, might go to the World Series again with how they're playing right now, those holes are going to be at the surface. And I hope Heim Bloom is taking a good long look at this team right now and is taking notes about what needs to be improved because he's the guy at the helm. He's the guy that needs to address those holes in this offseason if they truly want to contend in 2024. Coming up, I'm going to be addressing a positive thing about the Boston Red Sox, discussing the future a little bit. So that's coming up next. After a game like Wednesday's, you might need to decompress a little bit and get some good news 
that's why FanDuel has you covered for all things sports betting. If you want to make some money, maybe it'll make you feel better after a tough game and a series sweep. Um, right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets. Guaranteed. It's really awesome. It's a great app to use. Now is the best time to join it because you're getting, you're starting to get into playoff season for baseball. And so you have all the good teams that are going to be playing. So it becomes easier to bet on teams or bet on players. Um, the app is so easy to use and you can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. So it's highly recommended. I personally love it. I think it's the best sports betting app because of how easy it is to maneuver. And they highlight some of the bets that you have a better chance of hitting on and winning. So I truly, truly feel like if you want some good news at all, which we all could use right now, download the FanDuel app today. Despite the fact that the Red Sox series and you know, just game on Wednesday did not go nearly as planned and the season is likely over. The future is bright for Boston. When Heim Bloom took over as the chief baseball officer, his goal was to try to revamp the Red Sox farm system and build a team that could ideally contend in the future. That's what it appeared like he was trying to do. It seems like he's still prioritizing that by bringing a lot of good prospects into the system. The Red Sox farm system has improved a lot in his tenure, and that's certainly something to look forward to. Um, over the course of this season, because the Red Sox have seen a lot of injuries to key players, They've had to bring in some younger players. It started with Jaron Duran very early on, a couple of weeks into the season when Adam Duvall got injured and Duran had to come up from AAA. And the season he had has been going just so wildly good. Um, the way he contributed with his bat, the way he contributed with his speed and turning singles into doubles almost every time, um, and his ability to just have an awareness on the field has been an absolute difference maker for the Red Sox. And imagine what Duran's doing now and picture him in a couple of years. If he continues to develop the way that he is, he is going to be a crazy good outfielder for the Red Sox to have for years to come. That's totally a positive in my book for Boston. And not only him, but Tristan Casas is another player who's come a long way this year. Saw some playing time at the very end of the season last year, but this has really been his full, her first full season. Has been primarily playing first base and platooning a little bit with Justin Turner, but he has shown a lot of growth. He's cut down on the errors at first base significantly since the beginning of the season. His bat is moving. Um, he's getting some really good looks and he's primarily been taking a lot of very mature at bats, which is impressive for a rookie. He has the ability to recognize pitches that he probably shouldn't be swinging at. And he's very aware of the types of pitches that might be thrown next. And that absolutely consolates a professional. Um, so I think there's so much upside with Casas. I only expect him to continue to improve from here. There's a reason there was so much hype surrounding him when he first came up. Um, so that's another positive to look at. Raphael Devers is here for another 10 years. So Red Sox fans don't have to stress about him re-signing because um, they now have him locked in. That is your franchise player right there. That is the guy that you are going to continue to build around and hopefully win multiple championships with throughout the rest of his time here. I'd like to see his defense continue to get better. He's made some very nice plays at third base this year, but he still has room for growth there because he also made a decent amount of errors. So defensively, he needs to improve, um, but he's still a good hitter. I mean, it's Raphael Devers. He might not be having 
the type of season that you would hope he would have. But we've seen what he's capable of. A lot of pressure on him this year. I only expect him to just have a much better season at the plate next year. Um, and just even thinking about a couple of the younger players who showed some potential that haven't played a lot yet. Willier Abreu was in for a few games, put together some very impressive at-bats, is aggressive at the plate, isn't afraid to just hit the ball hard and hit for contact and doesn't seem to be afraid to strike out because he will swing at pitches, but he's swinging at good pitches. And I'm happy he's getting his chance because – if he continues to show that growth, then he could truly be a reliable outfielder going forward. So if you're looking at, you know, deeper into the future, I think it, it, we still need more time to really see if Abreu can be a strong, solid piece moving forward. But eventually, if you have an outfield that primarily consists of Duran, Abreu, and Yoshida with Rafaela eventually as that fourth outfielder, I mean – that's looking like a pretty good team right there. Um, and then whatever happens with Verdugo is still to be said. But when you have those players in your outfield, that's, you know, that's a good situation to be in with a lot of young talent over there. Raffaella, I'm glad that he's getting his chance. He ripped a double in Wednesday's game um, that ended up going for an RBI double. So I am excited to see more of what he can do. One of the Red Sox best prospects before he came up. And there's a reason that the Red Sox have held on to him. He can play in the infield. He can play in the outfield, which could absolutely be a weapon for Boston moving forward. So that's another young player to be excited about from a pitching standpoint, Brian Bayo, who still needs work and is still working on some things and, developing more confidence on the mound overall but we've seen some of that confidence when he has traffic on the base paths and he's been able to just have a good strong season overall and has ultimately been the Red Sox most reliable starter overall throughout the season maybe not as much as of late but overall he is the go-to guy as of now I still see him as a number two starter but that's even so promising still if you have Bayo as your number two and can go out and get a number one in the offseason, that one-two punch of whoever the Red Sox acquire plus Brian Bayo is pretty good. That has me excited for sure. Um, so definitely lots to be excited about here with the young talent the Red Sox have. I only expect Tanner Houck and Garrett Whitlock to continue to improve. The Red Sox need to figure out really what they're – positions are going to be. I, again, and I will continue to emphasize this, have always liked Whitlock better out of the bullpen than as a starter. So I hope they decide to keep him as a reliever and they can go out and get some starting pitching so they don't feel like they have to use him as a starter. But I like him as a reliever, but I think they'll keep Hauk as a starter, which is fine. He has very good stuff, just needs to work on the longevity and being able to eat up some more innings and not struggle when he hits the third time through the order as much. That's a young core that the Red Sox can continue to really build this team around. And Winkowski out of the pen, we've seen him go through a lot of growth this season. He was kind of thrown into the fire last year due to lots of pitching injuries and might have not been up to par with what Red Sox fans would have hoped. But he's had all of this season out of the pen to show that he has potential as well. So if the Red Sox can really go in and fill in the holes for 2024, you can think about the young talent that the Red Sox have now and the players who have started to produce who are younger and be excited about that group of players. Not even to mention the fact that you still have Marcelo Meyer in the Brinks, who's moving quickly through the ranks um, in the Red Sox farm system. Catcher Kyle Teal, who eventually is going to be coming up and has been bulldozing his way through the system so far since just being drafted a month or so ago. Um, so there's a lot of things to be excited about with this Red Sox team in the future. If they can go out and get a number one starting pitcher and shape up the bullpen a little bit, 
this team is going to go from being where they're at now to being a contender, but they absolutely have to figure out the defense situation. Having Story from the get-go at shortstop, I think will help solve a lot of those problems. Um, and then the question becomes, is it Reyes? Is it Hamilton? Is it Rafaela? Who's going to be the primary second baseman? Is it Urias? Um, and then I think the Red Sox are going to be in really good shape. Lots of talent. So when you think about the 2023 season and just how depressing and up and down it really was, just think about the future and think about all of the young talent that we've gotten to see up in the majors this season and how many players really have the potential to do big things for this team. And hopefully that'll leave you with a smile today on this Thursday because we definitely need something to smile about after that brutal series against Houston. The future is bright in Boston, and I'm here for the ride. Keep the faith. As always, go Red Sox, and I will catch you on the flip side.